And so let's meditate together. So as I always say at the beginning, it doesn't really matter how you're sitting, as long as you're sitting in a comfortable posture, that is the best posture for you. <clears throat> and it might not necessarily be the same posture that you normally sit in, because the body has different needs at different times. <clears throat> So I thought I'd start the meditation in the usual way, by coming in contact with our body, our inner world, and then gradually possibly lead you or invite you to pick up the breath if the breath seems to want to be picked up by you. <laughs> and as usual, these um, guidances are just invitations. They're not instructions. They're not rules that you have to follow. So if something else is unfolding or something else needs attention and uh, wants to be in the center of your mind, then please go with that because meditation should be responsive and intuitive to whatever's arising in the here and now. The most important thing is just that we establish a wise relationship to our minds. And if you're doing that, then the content of your mind is not so important at all. <clears throat> That's the part we can't control. So, just settling into your body, into the space and gently closing your eyes, maybe there's still some impressions of being in this group. The people's faces that you've just been seeing on the computer screen. And hopefully some sense of connection. Support. Shared intentions to come into this present with kindness, care, and a sense of allowing things just to be, making peace, not war, with our body and our mind. And just feeling how much relief is already available when you've put everything else down. For most of us, it's already the evening. It's grown dark. Some of us, this might just be a pause in the middle of the day. So just noticing the absence of busyness, the absence of sights, the quietening of sounds. And appreciating that emptiness.
And I'd also like to invite you, if you wish, to reflect on a beautiful quality, perhaps that you can already recognize in your own heart, but that you'd like to develop, to cultivate, bring forth, and align your actions of body and speech more and more closely to as this new year unfolds. See if you can get a felt sense of that beautiful quality, whether it's kindness, Perhaps remembering how it feels to be kind or receive the kindness of others. Perhaps contentment. Maybe patience or trust. Just see if you can connect to a felt sense of that quality. Maybe even repeating the word very gently inside your mind. And just sensing in to where that word inclines the mind. Does it bring a sense of uplift? Maybe courage or strength? And with this perception in mind, see if you can bring your awareness now to your body. Today, let's start at the tips of the toes. Part that's furthest away from the thinking brain. And as your awareness meets your toes, infusing this beautiful sense of kindness and warmth, or maybe that quality that you chose, perhaps a sense of contentment, gratitude, even trust, Opening fully to the experience, any sensation, or just a general sense of your toes. And 
and allowing that awareness infused by friendliness, warmth, to start spreading up through the feet into the ankles, the shins, the calves. Nothing to do in this moment but to be aware and to care. Allowing the sensations to open up and to invite you more fully into the experience of this present moment. Exploring the knees, receiving any sensations in the knees with the same open-hearted curiosity and care. And up through the thighs, exploring the entire area of the thighs, as though shining light in every little part, the folds behind the knees, the entire skin area. Maybe you've experienced sensations deep inside. Moving up into the buttocks. Maybe a bit more going on there. Perhaps sensations related to heaviness or lightness. The field of temperature. Maybe tingling or throbbing, aching. See if you can welcome all of those experiences with equal attention, equal care. Releasing any unnecessary holding, giving your buttocks permission to fully relax. And exploring the hip area, the lower back. And part by part, spreading this kind of awareness of the entire back. Suffusing your awareness with whatever beautiful qualities you wish. Qualities that help you open up with appreciation for this present moment. 
so that the present moment becomes a beautiful place to be. Moving outwards to the sides of the body, coming round to the front of the trunk, the abdomen area, perhaps noticing your belly rise and fall. softening into the sensations. And continuing to explore the diaphragm and the whole chest. Sending kind awareness inside to the organs. You don't have to name or visualize any organs inside, but just a general sense of caring, sensing in to what's going on inside. You may choose to linger over any areas of more intense sensation. You may wish to examine them a little more closely. Or if anything feels overwhelming, perhaps give them more space. Always aligning your intentions, the way that you're aware, with kindness, gentleness, and letting things be. giving your shoulders some attention and care, releasing any holding, inviting them to relax. And gently moving down your arms, allowing them just to hang freely, 
Noticing the elbows, the lower arms, all the way to the hands, the palms, the fingers, and the fingertips. Also opening to any pleasant sensation, maybe tingling, warmth, vibrating in the hands, the fingers. Just allowing it to be. without breaking the connection, the continuity with the arms. Moving back up again to the shoulder area. Checking if anything there has changed. Moving up through the neck, the back of the neck and the throat. Into the jaw. Noticing any tightness that you don't really need in the jaw. Maybe Relaxing it just a little. Relaxing your tongue, your lips. Receiving any sensations in the mouth area. Suffusing those sensations with kindness and care. Continuing to explore the entire face, the cheeks, the temples, the eyes. The brow and the forehead. Giving it permission to relax. As though all that tension and tightness were just draining down towards the ground. The eyeballs settling more deeply into their sockets. And even the brain and all this activity, the connections, the circuits in the brain, just temporarily going quiet. As 
though you've allowed the brain to have a little sleep. You continue to spread your awareness across the whole top of the head, the back of the head, the ears, the whole skull. Receiving any sensations that you experience over there. from here you may wish to just allow your awareness to once again expand this time down from the head to encompass the whole body a general sense of the body sitting Maybe you can feel the shape, the energetic field of the body occupying this space. Imagining the body floating so light. All remaining tensions, patterns of holding can just be released into the atmosphere around you. See how relaxed it's possible for your body to be. And notice the pleasure, the delight in a relaxed body. and a broad and spacious mind. And in this spaciousness, this presence, the mind might be subtle enough to notice the breath. If so, see if you can gently go along with the breath without holding it just floating along as though the breath were a gentle wave that you could relax your whole body on.
keeping the mind soft and receptive, not struggling in any way to retain the breath. But just see if that breath helps you become more present and at peace. Knowing that whatever arises is welcome. Every experience is an opportunity to be kind. Whether thoughts or emotions arise, just holding them all in this field of kind awareness. Sinking more deeply into now. And if any pleasure arises in the mind as a result of making peace, however subtle it may be, maybe just a quiet joy, or a sense of simplicity or contentment, allow the mind to notice that, to pick it up. Deepen your appreciation of this moment.
not needing to get anywhere. Just satisfied with this moment, with this part of this breath. So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. Staying embodied. I just invite you to once again, bring to mind that quality, that virtue that you thought about connected with in the beginning of this meditation. Bringing it to mind once again. And imagine it growing in your heart. As though your entire chest area will lit up with this beautiful quality that's already inside of you. Imagining that radiating outwards. Supporting those you come in contact with and keeping yourself aligned with your deepest values knowing it's there to return to at any time. So just kindly thanking yourself for this moment of peace that you offered, not just to yourself, but to all of us. Smiling within And as you gently open your eyes, smiling without, so we can all see each other's contented, happy faces. As we open our eyes. <laughs> Don't force it, but even a small smile can affect the mind. <laughs> Very nice. Mm. I hope that was nourishing. Uh, not too long, not too short. <laughs> well, I shouldn't hope that it wasn't too short. I should hope that it was too short for you and that you've progressed now and we should do our long sits in future. <laughs> we could. <laughs> You're always free to uh, write suggestions, you know, these are all possibilities. <laughs> so, as I told people in the beginning, I've been quite busy recently with my teaching schedule. So, 
I couldn't actually think of a particular theme for the evening. My mind was just, please don't make me think. So I decided to use this as a um, opportunity to dig a bit deeper into anything you'd like to um, share or ask about, comment about or explore together. And I also invited a few um, questions from anyone on Facebook and actually not many people had questions, but a couple of themes came in, which are, I mean, they could be entire talks in and of themselves, <laughs> but it's good for me to have those in my pocket just in case you're all so still and silent now that you can't actually speak. But uh, I doubt that's the case. <laughs> so as I said in the beginning, um, the recording will continue, but it will be fixed on my uh, screen so that if you would like to ask the question in person, we can unmute you and your voice will be in the recording, but not your face. Um, if that feels uncomfortable, you're welcome to put um, questions in the chat box. But it's always lovely for people to hear a voice other than my own and just to realize, you know, that so many of us have similar questions and uh, yeah, our voices are very relatable to others, I think. So I would suggest keeping the questions or the comments, you know, fairly, I mean, they don't have to be super brief, but, you know, not a kind of whole dialogue um, or monologue. Um, just so that we can fit as many people in as, we, as is possible. Even the cat. I see a very cute little pussy cat with Leah. <laughs> That's very nice. So the way this will work is that if you have a question and you'd like to ask it out loud, you can go to the participants button and in there there's a hand or there's a symbol that says raise hand. And then my co-host, I think Derek, has very kindly offered to or maybe agreed is a more honest word <laughs> uh, to unmute you. And, and before doing that, he'll mention your name so that you know who you are. Um, and then we'll take your question, okay? So I'll give you a couple of moments. And if no one has an instant question, I'll start with what they have. And what is a question from Terry? So. You'll need to unmute yourself, Terry. Yeah. I'm a bit confused and a bit unsure and not quite sure where I'm going with this in my mind. This idea of giving, um, the natural interaction between humans is if you give, you get back there's a it's it's a the more you give out the more you receive so where do where does buddhism or where does buddhist teaching go with the idea that you're not looking for a return for your giving if you could explore that a bit yeah sure I think it's really true that whenever we give, we receive. But I think from the Buddha's perspective, he's not so much interested in material uh, reciprocity. He's more pointing towards the fact that every time our motivations come from um, non-greed, which is basically the opposite of generosity. It's another word for, sorry, it is generosity, but put in the negative way. Um, whenever our thoughts or our actions, our intentions are motivated by non-greed, by generosity, that we already get the result of that because we have a happier heart. And if our motivation is one of generosity, by bringing that out into um, speech and actions, we're intensifying um, the power of that generosity. We're actually bringing it to fruition, if you like. So although karma starts in the mind through intention, it's actually um, increased and has more power when we put that out into the world and actually in in our interactions so that in itself is um, an instant reward if you like so the buddha's not teaching us to give in order to get something in return there's a whole sutta on the benefits of generosity and he lists various types of motive for being generous and all of them are positive but some of them are much more expecting a return than others 
And so they start with things like, I'm giving because uh, if I give, then I'll be popular or people will like me or I'll gain material um, wealth. And then I'm giving because it's what I should do. I'm giving because, you know, in our family or in our tradition, we're told to give. Yeah, so there, there's a little bit of, um, well, there's not actually that much understanding. It's more they're doing it based on a belief than on their own kind of understanding as to why. So perhaps they haven't quite understood the benefit as a direct experience at this stage. And then there's the giving that gives because um, one will go to a higher birth next time, or even that one will be happy in this life. Um, but the Buddha said that the highest of all those givings is giving for the sake of beautifying the mind. And I think this is really wonderful because the more we practice in Buddhism, the more we realize that by purifying our mind, we're actually creating the causes for more happiness for ourselves and others at the root level. Yeah, because you can also give feeling kind of like I gave to you, you should give back to me or I'm giving to you because I want you to change your behavior. And that's not as pure. That doesn't actually purify our mind. So when we do it just for the wish to um, yeah, prepare the foundation for our practice, to equip the mind with wisdom, with serenity, with happiness, then that is the highest kind of giving. And that's something that can be directly felt. So I hope that explores it a little bit. It's a big topic, but there's so many ways we can give. And I think it starts off in the path by virtue, you know, by um, by actually abstaining from giving out our negativity in the world, right? From abstaining from harming others. So we start by giving the gift of harmlessness, the gift of trust. And this is already a very beautiful gift, which benefits ourselves and everyone around us. So I think we're looking more at spiritual benefits than material benefits with um, generosity and giving. Yeah. But of course, as wisdom develops as well, we might also see where it's most profitable to give. For example, you know, you might feel like um, the more you know about a particular social cause, the more you feel that that is a good place to give because it's going to have good results. Whereas another place might, you know, maybe not use the money properly or it might not really lead to the long-term well-being and and, um, and happiness and health of another person so we also have to use our discernment a bit as well but um, yeah the Buddha also said last point about generosity that um, we should bring it up in our minds so that when we're thinking about giving we feel joy when we're actually giving we feel joy and after we've given we feel joy so we rouse the we kind of align our mind with the beautiful intention of giving and notice the effect that that has because that's like an encouragement for us to to know um more and more about right intention and, and right action what generosity really means okay i see there's some more hands okay next question from nilanti Uh, hello, um, Venerable Chanda. Uh, I I want to tell that when I am uh, looking my breath, I have so much back background things like. Uh, Nancy, sorry, could I just pause you because I have a feeling it might be recording people's voices. Is the video pinned to me, Derek? Is it pinned to me, or is it just on speaker view? It's pinned to me. Okay, all right. I'm just being over cautious. Sorry to interrupt you. Please continue. Uh, when I am uh, looking at my breath, there is so much background things like my body vibration and sometimes pictures. Uh, sometimes um, I heard voices inside, everything inside. But same time, I can feel my breath as well. So when it everything happened, uh, what should I choose is breath or any other things, uh, or everything is kind of, that is the first question. And second question is, I know you had world-based teachers about Goenka and Venerable uh, Ajahn Bra. So you know very well about uh, Vipassana meditation and Samatha meditation both. So when we are doing day-to-day -day meditation, I think if you can uh, mention this meditation type is going to this way or that way, kind of more knowledge 
to <laughs> I I know. This... <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah great right. I think this might be a whole dumber talk maybe I could do a talk on on, on that at some point um, but to go to your first question I guess it's related to your second one in the sense that perhaps it would depend a little bit on the type of meditation that you're choosing in that session. And I think sometimes it can be helpful to make a decision um, more or less at the beginning of the sit as to whether you're going to practice with more like an open awareness, like a bare awareness when, where everything that arises is equally as welcome and um, the mind can remain quite open and receptive to it all. So you're actually not choosing to sort of hone in on the breath necessarily. You're just observing things coming in and rising and passing. Um, and in that kind of meditation, it can be helpful if um, you are aware of the arising and passing nature, then it can turn more into like a Vipassana kind of practice. If on the other hand, you're setting out with an intention to calm the mind and you find that lots of other things are happening. If you're a bit unclear, about what kind of meditation you want to do and what your aim is in this particular meditation, then you might get a bit pulled about and be a bit unclear. So it's not a problem that lots of things are happening. It's not a problem, even if you know you are um, trying to calm the mind, but it's more a matter of priority, I would say, so that um, you know when these other things are happening, you're not necessarily just being dragged around so it's a bit like in the um, sutta on um, overcoming distracting thoughts. You can apply that to overcoming distracting noises, overcoming distracting anything, right? Any, any other object, any voices inside. And um, one of the methods there is just to let them be there, but just don't give them much attention. Yeah, method number three, I think it is like, just ignore those things. Um, and if the breath is there and it's, it's there without too much of a struggle, then your mind is ready for the breath. So it doesn't matter that these other things are happening. The only time the Buddha said that your mind's not ready for the breath is if you're obsessed with the hindrances, like um, thoughts filled with the hindrances still obsess the mind. Um, then you need to do a bit more preparation. So it might be helpful. I think it can be helpful to do more of the body scan because you're giving your mind a little bit more to look at if it's a bit restless still and establishing the mindfulness so that by the time you're ready for the breath the mindfulness is strong enough we have to get the mindfulness strong enough before we can um, observe the breath because the breath is a subtler object. So that's what I would say about your own um, practice and that experience. I think if you're with the breath, then don't worry too much about the rest, just ignore it. And after a while it settles down. These sessions are very short. I mean, if you're on a longer retreat, then it has time, you know, two, three days, four days, a month by then you know everything really does settle and the mind just starts to habitually um, receive its object its chosen object it's like you're creating a groove that it starts to flow along so as for the other question it's a massive question and just in brief I would say that one can start either with vipassana methods which are more focused on not only like we do the body scan but actually looking at the nature of experience so the characteristics of impermanence change arising and passing away and those sensations thoughts emotions um, or we can start with uh, breath meditation i started my uh, meditation life with um, an emphasis on vipassana which includes some breath meditation but not enough to get particularly still at least in my case unless you do the long retreats like 45 days then you have 10 days of anapana so that's much better but on the short courses it's just three days and I never got very far um, so that was really great for me because it gave me a, a very deep on well not I can't say that my understanding is very deep but it gave me enough appreciation of impermanence to establish quite a lot of equanimity in my daily life that really changed my life actually and it also made me want to ordain because I could see that there was nothing to hold on to there's nothing you can hold on to in this world you know so that gave me the confidence and the stability and equanimity also to let go bit by bit and and um, take a monastic path um, but Unless you actually deepen your samadhi to a really high degree, I would say, until the hindrances are actually absent, 
the insight that arises is not likely to be enough for stream winning because that is really, really deep insight that's needed. You have to penetrate the Four Noble Truths completely um, in their entirety, which means you have to see the pervasive nature of suffering in every experience that's possible to have as a human being, right? So for that, I think you need very deep samadhi. And the, you know, basically the deeper the samadhi, the deeper the wisdom is bound to be. So I met a few teachers, I had other teachers before Ajahn Brahm and between Goenka. Uh, one of them is Bhante Ujagara, who Diana here knows very well. And he'd done all the Vipassana practice and come to the same place as me, where the wisdom wasn't going much deeper and he realized he needed to practice jhanas basically. And I met him in about 2007 while I was in Burma. And um, he basically gave the analogy of sharpening the knife. Like you need a really sharp knife to penetrate, to cut the vegetables say, but really what it means is to cut through delusion. And if you have a blunt knife, no matter how many hours a day you practice, that knife is blunt, you know? <laughs> um, so then meeting Ajahn Brown's teachings for me was wonderful because he gave me a different way into Samato. It was a way of um, contentment rather than a way of struggling with the breath. It was a way of, you know, really creating like a lot of inner joy, which is, of course, all in line with the Buddha's teachings in the suttas. And so this was very helpful for me. And I started to um, enjoy that kind of practice much more. So I'm still working on that. I'm still working on that. Yeah. Bit by bit, it goes a bit deeper, but it, I haven't really um, like taken it back into the Vipassana because I still want to deepen my samadhi. So I haven't actually gone back and done Vipassana very much and apart from just to overcome like coarser hindrances and my understanding now from Ajahn Brahm is that I might not need to anyway because if the mind is uh, very very clear like after a jhana especially after you do a lot of jhana practice then and you already have some right view and some practice and some understanding of the characteristics then the mind will naturally look in that direction so for me the path is becoming much less technique oriented and much more of a natural process and I don't make such a division anymore between Samatha and Vipassana mm. the two sort of dance around each other so that was quite a long answer because it was a a, a big question um, and I'll try and maybe do some more a little bit more briefly can we go to the other person with their hand up is that okay uh, Venerable someone let me know that I was actually wrong and uh... yes I read that yes so, okay, <laughs> next speaker is Rob. Is it now pinned to me? It's still okay. not pinned to me. Can you hear me? Yeah, but it's not pinned to me still, Derek. Is there something we can do? Basically, the people who've asked the questions have been recorded. I'm really sorry about that. If anybody oh, oh, oh. is not happy with that, could they tell me before the end of this session? Because then we won't put the video out. I will be recorded. Venerable, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it is pinned to you and only your face has been showing throughout the whole video. Well, it seems we don't really know. But anyway, could somebody just say in the box if you've asked a question out loud and you don't want to be on the recording, if you could just give me a note, just in case. All right. So, Rob, go okay. for it. All right. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about... I've noticed in Zen Buddhism, there's a, a strong emphasis on mindfulness in daily life, in the practices that you do, like having a cup of tea or washing dishes. I was wondering how prevalent that is in the Theravada tradition and how important you think it is to carry on that mindfulness away from the sitting yeah. meditation. Great question. Great question. Yeah, I mean, no doubt it's important. I think it's a matter of how we do it and for me my definition has changed over time because when I was doing the vipassana um, practice being aware of the arising and passing of sensations my aim was to be aware of that all the time in every activity and yeah I did get quite proficient in that I can't say I was as deeply aware all the time but I was always aware of something you know physical like some contact in the body whether inside or out and so that was a very obvious um, continuity there especially in retreat conditions of course in daily life it can be more difficult because most of the time the problem is we forget to come back to um, to our object of meditation 
But later on, my understanding changed a bit because what I saw could sometimes happen with some meditators is that they'd get very tense. And it's almost like if they were doing Anapana, for example, and then they had to have a conversation with you, this is in a retreat setting in a monastery, they would almost be like resenting that conversation because it was taken away from the breath. And sometimes you'd talk to someone and you, you'd know that they weren't really listening because they were trying to be with their breath and they were just trying to kind of get away from you. And I just started to think that can't be right, you know, because surely we should, you know, relate to each other, relate to everything that arises in our life with an open heart and with, you know, a kind of unconditional type of awareness. So when I came in contact more with the Sutta teachings and also with Ajahn Brahm, he emphasized that whatever you're doing, give it everything you've got. So if you're talking, talking is your object of awareness. You're really in the present moment with now I am, now I'm saying it, the way the lips are moving and the tone of the voice and, you know, just the act of talking and the purpose of what you're doing, why you're doing it in this case to convey um, an understanding of the Dhamma. Um, and yeah, likewise, if you're sort of washing the dishes, you make washing the dishes the most important thing. So you're not only aware of sensations, you're also aware of why you're washing the dishes and then you do it with a lot of, um, um, yeah, I mean, you can't do it with that much wisdom, but <laughs> you know why you're doing it. You know, you don't want to like leave it too long so that they're really difficult to wash off, right? So you're doing it in a way out of care for your environment, out of care for yourself. And I, I have that reflection nowadays when I do the dishes, I sort of think, yeah, this is like looking after things to keep my life simple and to keep it looking, you know, looking neat. And that has an effect on my mind. So there's different ways we can be aware in everyday life. I don't think we have to over effort. If we're at the point where we actually can't do that, it's okay. We just have to remember as often as and say, oh, you know, can just pause here, take a breath or become aware of what I'm doing and why. Um, otherwise too much tension can come into the practice. Um, but this is where a balance between your sitting practice and your daily life practice is really good. If you have an established practice, say, I mean, I, I started with two hours a day because that was what Goenkaji told us was the bare minimum. And so I'm very lucky since 96, I've always had that, you know, and it changes your life completely because then the awareness flows over quite naturally into the other things that you do. But yeah, sometimes you're observing more of a restless mind or more of an agitated mind, and that's fine too. So certainly, I mean, we want to become aware in everything, in every activity, so that we are protecting our mind um, by making sure that we're not um, following greed, hate and delusion. And we're trying to align our actions of body and speech in particular with the opposites with the uh, generosity, the loving kindness and the wisdom part of the mind. So, great. All right. Should we um, go to someone in the box now, um, Derek? Okay, so there is a couple of messages in the chat box. Okay. And great. would you like me to read it or? No, it's okay, I'll find them. Because I'll try and get people who haven't asked us many. Okay. Dear Venable, I have a doubt about where consciousness is and how it is formed within a being. Ooh, I should have read this before reading it. <laughs> and how it moves from one life to another. Mm. I'm glad you asked the last question because I had contemplated that earlier. Um, yes, of course, we have a doubt about that because it's not an easy thing to see. And also, it's not necessarily a helpful question to ask where consciousness is. Consciousness is in the mind. It's actually the six kinds of consciousness in Buddhism, right? So there's ear consciousness, eye consciousness, nose, taste, um, body and mind consciousness. So there's six kinds of consciousness. And they're not really anywhere. They're Basically what creates consciousness is when your um, organ of consciousness, so the I, comes in contact with a sight. And when it comes in contact, there's um, contact, yeah? So you have your eye, you have the object of the eye, and then there's contact. And as a result of that contact, eye consciousness arises. So the delusion that we have is that we think that the eye consciousness is there all the time, and that it's just kind of waiting for something to come and arise. 
for an object to come, but it's actually not there until there's a an object of sight and it comes into contact and then consciousness at the eye door arises and the feeling based on that consciousness as well. Um, so it's the same for the other sense doors and it's the same for the mind consciousness as well. It's not actually there waiting. It's not anything permanent. It comes when there is an object of the mind. And obviously there are so many objects of the mind because each thing that we are aware of at the sense door, we also then process in the mind, through the mind um, consciousness, manovinyana. So how it is formed within a being, it has delusion <laughs> in the Paticca Samapada, the dependent arising delusion is the cause for this arising of this process that we call body and mind. Um, avidya pachaya um, sankara, so because of um, delusion, um, sankara, which is like a volitional intention or reaction arises. And as a result of that, consciousness arises. So we have to want to see something before we see it. If we have our eyes closed, if we're not looking, we won't see it. So volition arises, then consciousness arises with the contact. And then from consciousness, um, yeah, actually in this particular sequence, it's the consciousness, then the contact, but they happen together. They happen at the same time. And the Vedana happens as well. So the feeling um, happens as a result. Um, there's also Nama Rupa, which is basically mind and mental content that's there as well. I think. But then the important part is that it's from Vedana that we, um, from Vedana means feeling, the feeling that arises dependent on consciousness um, and contact. It's the feeling that can then lead to craving or aversion. Because if we get a feeling that's pleasant, like we see a sight that we think, wow, that's nice. And then a pleasant feeling arises in our body and mind. We want more of it, yeah? So you see, say, a movie that you enjoy. And then afterwards you feel a little bit like, oh, it's over now. And then you think, oh, I must see it again. So, yeah, because you had a pleasant feeling, you want to get that feeling back. So craving arises. And the other side of craving, of course, is aversion, you know, craving to get rid of something that's unpleasant. So this is the place where if we become aware of the feelings that are arising due to this um, contact at any of the sense doors, and we can also see that that feeling is impermanent, that feeling is not me, that feeling is not actually a true source of happiness, then we learn not to react with so much craving and aversion. It's just a feeling. It's just a sensation arising to pass away. That's all it is. There's nothing really there that's substantial enough to hold on to. And it works for things like anger. I mean, this is one of the benefits of that sort of um, Vipassana practice. If you feel like a sense of say fear or irritation arising, you're actually with the sensation of that in your body and you can feel it arise as vibrations. So it's not a fixed thing. It's actually something very eph ephemeral, very um, almost like transparent. The Buddha calls it like mustard seeds like Vedana is like mustard seeds popping in the pan, or it's like bubbles on the water. That's another one. Bloop, 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 bloop. I think like when you see the vein falling on water, sometimes you see plop, 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 plop. That's like Vedana. So when you see it like that and it's not solid, there's a lot less um, force in it to cause a reaction, if you like, because it's something that's just very essenceless. So, and because of that, um, the craving for a future life also starts to uh, be diminished. The craving for experience in general starts to diminish. And you get more of a taste for like peace, for beautiful, subtle qualities of the heart, things like virtue, things that are still in the realm of feeling, but they're much subtler and less connected to the senses. They're less sensual, if you like. So the way that consciousness moves from one life to another, it moves because of craving. Um, and it is just consciousness that goes across, so to speak. So it's not a person, it's a process. And for people who have seen through the, through the, um, apparent solidity of consciousness and understand consciousness too is impermanent. They understand it's just like 
moments of consciousness going across. It's like a process that goes across. But we tend to um, ascribe a sense of self to that. Yeah. So the Buddha said that it's not that there's nothing because the arising of phenomena is seen. And it's not that there's something because the passing away can be seen. But instead, there's this middle way, which is the dependent origination. So from delusion, uh, sankhara arises, volition arises. From volition, consciousness arises. From consciousness, um, f- contact, I think, then nama rupa, then feeling, then ve- um, craving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a process called dependent origination. And it's a massive question. And I mean, if you really want to go into it in depth, then I would suggest going to the Samyutta Nikaya, chapter 12, called Nidana Samyutta. And that explains it in more detail. Okay. So we've got another 10 minutes. I told people on Facebook that I'd ask the, answer their question. There was one person whose question I do want to answer because it really came. We've covered another person's question with that, I think. But this one came from an important place and that was that they had trouble staying in the present moment. Why do I find it so difficult to stay in the present moment? What help can you offer, please? So I'll answer that quickly. And I think the main reason it's difficult to stay in the present moment is because of restlessness and craving And our minds are just on kind of high speed because we're so often in the past and in the future. So it becomes really difficult to suddenly stop the mind. And that's completely natural and normal if you've been rushing around in your head all day or very busy with responsibilities, it's completely natural. So that's the first reason that it's hard to stay in the present moment. We're not really familiar with it. We're not really um, accustomed to sort of slowing down our mind But the other reason, if you are a meditator and you've been practicing for a while, can be because we're not content with the present moment. We're looking for something better, for something else. So we're sort of present, but we're sort of present in order to get something later. (laughs) I'll be present so that, you know, my meditation will improve or I'll be present because I should or, you know, just because you know it's a good thing to do but you're not actually really giving to the moment so sometimes we come to practice wanting to get results and actually we need to start changing our motivation into one of giving to this moment like okay how can I befriend this present moment how can I actually be kind to it and when we learn kind of how to look upon the present moment like something precious something that's worthy of our care that's worthy of our time um then that present moment starts to feel kind of welcome and accepted and you start to establish a a good relationship with the present moment and as a result of that you start to be able to stay for longer in that present moment so that is one um, suggestion i would have to see if you can befriend the present and um yeah and uh and be patient be very very patient and gentle with it as well yeah because every moment of present moment awareness you know even if you're running around all day but suddenly you're aware for a moment oh this is my body this is my breath this is what i'm doing and you know i'm doing it for a good reason i'm doing it out of kindness that's a moment of awareness And those moments will add up and will add up and add up. So don't focus on when you're not present. Just try and appreciate when you are and notice how it feels and see if you can value that a little bit more. Okay. So we've got five minutes before Mel has to go, isn't it, Mel? But we'll continue. So I'll finish the questions in five minutes. Okay. Yes, so I think I've answered your question, Satira, that it's due to delusion and attachment to the five aggregates that keep us roaming from one life to another. But is there a first point where we enter samsara? (laughs) That's an easy question. The Buddha said that there is no discernible beginning of samsara because there's no discernible beginning of delusion. 
So it's another of those questions that there wasn't really an answer to because it doesn't really matter. But what he did say, which is very helpful, is that um, although there's no first cause for delusion, delusion, I'm translating ignorance here as delusion, because I think it's a better translation, um, it has nutriment, it has things that feed it, and the things that feed delusion are the five hindrances. Okay, so this is why practicing at the level of sensation to try not to crave is not actually enough because the process has already started. So it's really important that our practice should also be undermining the hindrances because it's only when the hindrances are overcome that delusion is not being fed at that time. And that's another reason why Samatha meditation takes the wisdom much deeper because it's with the samadhi, especially the jhanas, and the point just before or after the upachara samadhi, but it should be very steady without any hindrances. Um, so Ajahn Brahm always says it's the upachara after the jhanas, which is the um, reliable one. Um, only in those experiences is delusion not operating for a time. Otherwise, there's always some delusion there. We think we're seeing things as they are, but our perception is not bare. Our awareness is not bare awareness, as long as the five hindrances are distorting the truth. So I hope that helps. And yeah, don't worry too much about it. You're here now. So the question is not how did you get here, but how do you get out? <laughs> okay, I'll go to Shirley's question because I think we just about have time. It seems hard to cultivate contentment when experiencing sadness at all the suffering around us. I would appreciate your reflections on this, Venerable. Thank you. Yes, so we have to be content with sadness because remember, Shirley, it's not only contentment as an experience, as an emotion. It's also contentment as a way of relating to what arises. So at that moment, you might not experience the emotion of contentment, but if you can learn to be content with the sadness, it's almost like the sadness is your object, but your mind is just kind of looking at that sadness in a really welcoming way, in a really soft and tender kind of way that's saying really sadness, you're okay, you're welcome here. And it's really okay to be sad even for the whole hour or the whole week is really okay then when it is truly okay for you that is when you're content and if you are truly content with that sadness then you'll start experiencing contentment <laughs> so that's the way through into contentment rather than trying to what do you call it circumvent the sadness to arrive somewhere else. So it's about opening to the sadness. I've been experiencing quite a bit of sadness today, actually since I heard a talk from Ajahn Brahm yesterday because it just irritated me. <laughs> I can say that, can't I? Yeah, it just irritated me because basically the monks were getting credit for something that I'd done. And it's okay, it's not like I'm looking for credit, but the whole patriarchy sometimes just feels to really overvalue male monastics and actually undervalue female monastics and this was not intentional it's just that he honestly didn't know and um, so often you know the efforts and the visibility <laughs> and all that nuns do and I think women do also in society is just not really even seen so I was feeling sad about that and I'm not saying it's anyone's fault but you know sadness is there life is not easy and there's a lot to be sad about um, so yeah, yesterday I felt the sadness pretty much all the way through my sitting, but then at one point I really did infuse it with kindness and I put my hand on my heart, which I don't normally do, but my whole body started to kind of get all soft and actually quite pleasant, um, for that period because I was using kindness to observe my experience. And afterwards the sadness kind of was there again, but it doesn't matter so much because you're learning that along with that sadness, there can also be kindness, there can also be tenderness. And so you're learning to, to open up. So I hope that helps.